thank you rabina uh, very much for that uh, timely opening of the beautiful session uh, so good afternoon everybody thank you my own kaho team uh, thank you santwana zubair for really making this series really happening every month uh, i am here to introduce my very dear friend dr vijay lakshmi shinde and she is first of all uh, uh, a very good friend she hails from my place uh, tumbuli she is a md microbiologist uh, with 14 years of experience uh, very very passionate about um, you know basically i always hear infection control is is like what she would love to do always and she does it very efficiently she is a certified infectious uh, disease uh, trainer apart from that she is our own kaho certified assessor uh, for cssd and 14 years of experience in diagnostic clinical microbiology and infection control as i said very passionate about training and health you know our people across both the verticals be it doctors nurses you will hear it very soon now from her she has uh, been associated with more than 50 hospitals and more than 7000 healthcare professionals currently i know she is the president of ima dombivli she was very active always in these associations and i'm glad that she's a part of kaho uh, looking forward for many more sessions from you vijay lakshmi and all the very best to all of our participants have a wonderful learning over to you vijay lakshmi thank you so much for this kind introduction madam uh, as you uh, introduce me uh, you have already uh, told a lot about uh, me and infection control i think they go hand in hand and today you have give, given me a very technical topic of uh, gram stain and zn stain uh, anyways of course i am first a microbiologist clinical microbiologist and considering the audience is more of technologist i have tried to keep most of the practical things and day to day practice what we do in our commercial laboratories or hospital laboratories uh, the same things i will uh, touch uh, i'm not going much into detail and confusing you all with more or a lot of academics so since i have a lab uh, i own a lab and uh, daily day to day reporting of microbiology which we all do uh, but there are many some there are some things uh, which uh, are, are, are should be known to all the technologists across Uh, what are the daily qa qcs technicalities of uh, of gram stain z instant not wasting much time i'm sharing the screen yeah okay yeah so today we'll speak about quality assurance staining and reporting gram stain and afb stain uh, quality assurance is a complete program uh, all those hospitals or laboratories who are part of nabh and nabl or any or, or any quality assurance program which are conducted at your healthcare facility you must be uh, aware about the quality assurance uh, program so today we'll uh, uh, stick to the technicalities of gram stain and afb stain and how to improve the quality of the stains reporting interpretation and uh, internal quality controls so uh, as you know uh, gram stain a, a little about theory because the background is really important is a danish bacteriologist hans christian gram uh, and it was devised in 1882 published 1884 Uh, this is a matter of differential staining which differentiates gram positive organism from the gram negative organisms so as a technologist or as a microbiologist or any lab person what you require is a clean processing desk a specimen uh loop uh, good uh, good quality slides burners and gram stain kit so uh, in i remember uh, 15 years back all the microbiologists or the technologists who have worked uh, who are working since decades they must be knowing they pre previously used to make the stains from the powders dilute them according to the appropriate concentration and then they used to make the stain but uh, nowadays there are lot many commercial gram stain kit available and they are equally good and of course we have our qa qc sops to uh, to improve the quality of it so gram stain kit it can mostly consist of the crystal violet gram iodine decolorizer and a safranet so what is crystal violet the crystal violet action as uh, it acts as a primary stain gram iodine it acts like a mordant alcohol acts as a decolorizing agent mostly we use acetones or alcohols safranin or neutral red acts as a counter stain so basically in this kit we have four bottles crystal violet gram iodine alcohol safranin or neutral red so how do you do the staining procedure 
So prepare a smear. So first of all, you should have a good sample, which is not very contaminated. Preferably, in a, it should be a sterile uh, container uh, having this sample. Uh, so we prepare, should you have your desk ready? I would. I am a microbiology and infection professional, infection control professional. So it's really important that you have a clean desk. Uh, you uh, take all the standard precautions while handling this kind of any any clinical specimen. And you your workstation you, sh you should have a, at least a laminar floor or biosafety cabinet or plus two at least. Uh, it's always preferred because nowadays a lot of clinical samples, the sputum uh, like respiratory secretions come uh, body fluids are coming and many infective samples come especially in the hospital tertiary care setup you have tertiary level lab you get a lot of samples from critically ill patients so it's our infective patients so it's always uh, better to take the infection control precautions standard precautions for uh, handling any sample so prepare a smear in a proper lab area processing area uh, uh, first of all all the pre-analytical uh, part of any lab processing is you have to confirm the identification, patient name, type of specimen, uh, appropriateness of the specimen. So these things uh, have to be confirmed. Then heat dry, uh, uh, after making the, uh, take the grease free slide, uh, you can make a smear. Uh, you can make a smear of two by three centimeter, two by two centimeter, and uh, it should the, it should not be very thin or very thick. It should be just uh, uh, thin uh, thin enough uh, that it is uh, like we can read across a newspaper. Okay, so if it's too thick, you'll not be able to make out the cells. If it is too thin, uh, like uh, you may miss out on some, on something. So it's always better to have an appropriate thickness. So once the smear is uh, spread and made, you uh, allow it to air dry in a heat fix. Cover the smear with crystal violet uh, for one minute. Rinse with water. Cover with the grams iodine for one minute. Decolorize with acetone alcohol for 10 to 20 seconds. Rinse with water. Again, flood with saponin uh, that is a counter stain. Rinse with water. Dry. I usually don't uh, uh, allow my technologies to uh, blood dry it or wipe the uh, thing because you tend to wipe out the smear or the water uh, flow should be not too sharp or too much to wash out the smear. So these steps are really delicate and important to maintain the quality of the and integrity of the smear. So rinse with water, dry it properly. Air dry is a better method. Observe under the microscope at uh, oil, oil immersion. So what are the cares or precautions you take during the staining? The smear should be ideal, not too thick and not too thin. As I already told you, reagents, correct order and time. Okay, if you are a new technologist, it's always uh, uh, important that your senior trains you or your, you should have a chart uh, display at the uh, place of the wash basin area or the staining area. Or at least you read the SOPs before going to the state because we are handling patient samples and the report is a clinical report with a lot of differential diagnosis, which we are going to inform the clinician, right? So it is always better to follow the steps properly, the sequence of the steps and the time for the steps. So crystal wallet is then, uh, once you start, first, as, as we have discussed, crystal wallet is the first step. So it should be rinsed gently. Uh, with a uh, good flow of water, not a forceful flow of the water. Declaration is also again a critical step. Too much declaration will wash away the smear. The counter stain will not be taken properly. Your primary stain may get washed off, washed off in the decolorization. So it's a critical step, neither prolonged or non insufficient. Uh, so we used to tell our students or the technologies that uh, tak aap, uh, when you put the stain, and uh, it should be like uh, the uh, the color which is visible or excess color which is visible on the smear it should go off okay and that is the end point the last the color goes off the so counter stain should be not be prolonged now if you have done the first three steps appropriately and you uh, and you just uh, do the counter stain uh, step over do it so you your the previous steps uh, they become unimportant uh, or uh, you ha hamper the quality of the smear. So all the steps, correct order and time should be pro followed properly. So how do you do QC? Uh, so it is advisable when we were students or when we were uh, facing audits or doing audits. So we used to tell that uh, we should, on the smear at the, at the beginning of the day or, or the, at the beginning of the batch, 
of any new stain kit which is open, you should do a quality control. So we have positive controls and the negative control. Ideally, they had they have to be like every stain, a stain, every smear should have a positive and a quality control run along with that batch. Uh, but sometimes most of the hospitals or the labs they do at the uh, beginning of the day or at the at the change of the batches. So positive control is the Staphylococcus aureus, which is a gram positive cocci. And ATCC strain is 2.923. And the morphology is gram positive cocci, which are spherical in shapes because cocci are spherical. Negative is E. coli, ATCC strain 2.922. They are pink in color, they're straight rods. Okay, so these are the quality control uh, strains which I use uh, along with your specimen. So I would advise at the beginning of the day or at the bad change, you should uh, do. Uh, the quality control because this uh, uh, it, it becomes a daily practice and it of course uh, you can immediately compare otherwise you'll end up saying gram variable uh, uh, organisms and of course we do have gram variable organisms but you should not get confused at the time of reporting so how do we interpret the gram stills so interpretation and reporting you may have your own template of reporting of course interpretation has to be done by an expert he should be an md uh, in pathology microbiology uh, or a relevant md uh, lab medicine and the person uh, who is reporting or uh, seeing the slides he should have expertise it can be a senior technologist also who can see the smears uh, he may not report but he can of course see the smears and uh, the the slides like the uh, he should have he or she should have adequate experience of uh, seeing these slides because there's a lot of subjective expertise which is involved in uh, seeing doing any kind of microscopy the more smears you see the more normal smears you see the abnormal findings you can better pick up right i hope you all agree with this so what do all what all structures do we see in any clinical specimen so we usually see in you know, any type of stain or any clinical specimen the common structures seen are the our human inflammatory cells or normal cells like we can see uh, neutrophils eosinophils so depending upon type of the stain so in gram stain we usually comment upon the polymorphonuclear cells or the pus cells Okay, and then we come, uh, 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 of course, comment upon the epithelial cells because and the organisms which are which we expect or we uh, tend to report. So, pus cells they are the normal inflammatory cells in, at any uh, given sample. So, whatever pus cells are there, you can grade them. Uh, mostly, we grade it as plenty pus cells, abundant pus cells, moderate pus cells, occasional pus cells, uh, several pus cells. Uh, so you can just grade those pus cells. Epithelial cells are the similar way. We can grade them as um, plenty, abundant, moderate, several, occasional. And organisms also you can just grade. We don't uh, grade as a quantity to do 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus in gram stain. We tend to avoid that because that kind of uh, grading is usually in the routine samples, in the wet mum samples we tend to do. But in the gram stain, you are, uh, are more of relative kind of grading we do because uh, we are not calibrating or cal uh, or volume is not fixed so it's always better to report in uh, in grading way okay so uh, why what is the importance of this so the pus cells will of course tell you the uh, intensity of the inflammatory reaction at that point the intensity of the infection that sample is having or sometimes it may be just inflammatory reaction if you have a lot of blood in that sample of course you will see more of uh, ne uh, neutrophils in that so you have to know you have to correlate with the gross specimen also so the pus cells uh, they tell us about the uh, severity of the infection epithelial cells more epithelial cells this means uh, uh, as a clinical microbiologist, I usually say that it may be having a lot of uh, contamination or the specimen is not appropriately collected. Your urine sample showing a lot of uh, epithelial cells or the sputum sample showing a lot of epithelial cells. Uh, it means the, the collection may not be an appropriate collection. So epithelial cells uh, need, need to be also looked um, uh, into. Organism, of course, you can grade them as well. Plenty uh, uh, GPC, plenty gram negative rods. Uh, plenty budding yeast cells. We, we tend to report plenty, moderate, occasional. So it gives a clinician a, 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 a kind of severity. Of course, this is not a quantification as such, but it can, uh, of course, tell us about the, uh, the load of the uh, inflammatory reaction or the bacteria at that point. So gram-positive bacteria, they are dark, dark purple. Gram-negative bacteria, they are light red. Uh, gram variable bacteria show an intermediate reaction. You may not be able to make out whether it is gram positive. They are more on the red side, but still you may not be. The examples like uh, sonatovectors, gram negative cocovacilla, they are slightly gram regular. You get to get, tend to get it confused with staphylococcus aureus. So gram non-reactive 
like certain like they are uh, mycobacteria and spirochetes we don't get stained by gram stain suggestive or probable organisms uh, can be done uh, at the end of the reporting sometimes you may get a sample key, uh, like knee joint fluid for gram stain so what are you going to see? So if you have a knee joint, a synovial fluid for gram staining, because the orthopedic surgeon expects to tell us what the pustules and the and the organisms. So pustules they uh, suggest you more for they want whether it is a septic arthritis or any kind of other inflammatory arthritis or uh, osteomyelitis. So in that case, we tend to report whatever pustules we see and the organisms. So we can always write if you see uh, uh, gram positive cocci in clusters. So you can always write in the bracket as suggestive of or the probable or probable organism as Staphylococcus aureus. So I hope you have uh, understood the steps of gram stain, quality control and precautions during gram stain. So we'll come uh, to the slide basics. Uh, so uh, this gram stain uh, is usually a differential kind of stain. Organism is resist uh, degradation uh, by organic. Uh, uh, Vijaya Lakshmi, can I inter interrupt you? Yes. Uh, I want you to elaborate a little bit if you can or you have a slide on this variable gram variable if you can yeah i, I think i have a slide in between gram variable organisms okay, okay thank you yeah uh, madam i just want to know how much time i have uh, for this session you have uh, i think we our session is between 4, four to, to 6, six. So you, can, you can take around so yeah. that wherever in places I can elaborate something. So that's why I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. Please, thank please. you so much, madam. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, the uh, the principle of the gram stain, as uh, you all know, it is a differential kind of stain which resists decolorization of organic solvents, retain the primary stain, and appearing violet as called gram positive, which are organ whereas organisms that are decolorized and take the counter stain, appearing pink, are called as gram negative organisms. There are three theories of gram stain, cell wall theory, magnesium ribonucleate theory, isoelectric pH theory, and acid based theory. I don't yeah, think so we should uh, go into Sorry, into oh, phone pe ka, call, call chal raha hai. Bol. Madam, I... uh, uh, Aparna, madam, I think uh, your phone is uh, on unmute. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so gram staining uh, practical uses. Uh, so what are the practical uses as we uh, as i'm discussing i'm already telling you the clinical examples of course the most practical uses we can differentiate since it's a differential stain gram positive and gram negative organisms uh, it helps us as a uh, microbiology technician to select a media for microbiology cultures then choose antibiotics if you, you give a report of gram positive or gram negative organism as your primary report or the primary samples as a provisional report a clinician can choose the antibiotics well before the culture appears so it gives a clinician direction of course this will help uh, us to prevent antibiotic resistance in uh, future but uh, uh, sometimes comments as colonizers can be there in the samples uh, but yes, the clinician understands well and they prefer provisional reports for starting the antibiotics. Morphology. In gram stain, we can, of course, uh, tell about the morphology. It is a cocci, it is a bacilli, it is a GERB bacilli, it is a pleomorphic bacilli. They are in the cluster, they are in diplococci, they are lanceolate shape, they are spherical shape, oval shape, slightly bigger oval uh, yeast-like uh, structure. So this morphology, of course, can give us a preliminary provisional report. Then diagnosis, yes, again, as I'm uh, talking, uh, I'm telling you the same thing, preliminary provisional report itself can give you a provisional diagnosis as well. It can differentiate between the different type of organism. You may have mixed organism. You may have gram positive, gram negative mix. You may get polymicrobial uh, stain reports as well. In that also, it helps us to tell the consultant that it's a polymicrobial, you may have to repeat the sample. And differentiates the pathogenic or common cell. If you are experts in microbiology or pathology or you're in lab medicine, you of course know what are the common cells and our colonizers at, at that particular site. For example, in sputum, you will have a lot of gram positive uh, cocaine in chains. So they can be in the in sputum gram positive cocaine chains are mostly streptococcus viridans or commensal streptococci, which may which need not be reported. But if you are reporting, you may have to so they have to be differentiated. Your clinician needs to differentiate. You have to educate your clinician for these commensals or uh, uh, colonizers because pathogens they also know. So if you see uh, uh, key, this first slide, so in this first slide, if you see this gram positive cocci, this is a, this is a gram positive spherical uh, round cocci and they are arranged in grape-like fashion. So this could be a slide of 
Staphylococcus the, the tetras. These are large gram positive cocaine tetras or clusters. So they can be micrococus, uh, which can be skin commensals. If you see here, they are uh, gram positive. Thin cocci arranged in chase, they can be streptococcus species. Uh, if you can see spore bearing uh, gram positive bacilli, bacilli are rods. Uh, and if you can see terminal spore like structure, there can be some clostridium, uh, uh, clostridium species, uh, which can cause the food poisoning. So, so these are terminal spores, so mostly these are titanus. So they can be clostridium titanus, titani species. If you see the next slide, you can see pustules as well as gram positive cocci there. Uh, and you can see some slight clearing uh, besides the cocci. So this is a clearing. Uh, structure there's some clearing it can be a capsule so gram stain cannot uh, they, uh, they are not capsule or strains so capsule stains are different but if you see such kind of clearing this means there is some kind of capsule or some reaction around this cell so uh, suggestive of streptococcus pneumonia if you see the next slide here it is a lot of pus cells here with intracellular gram negative cocci. So, gram negative cocci are very few. Nigeria species like Meningo cocci or Gono cocci. So, they are intracellular, very uh, tiny gram negative coco bacilli. So, these also tend to be gram variable at times. So, you need to be very, uh, uh, very particular in staining such kind of specimens because uh, they are very delicate organisms and they're intracellular, and that's where the staining can get. Uh, uh, the, if you don't do a proper st uh, proper uh, staining, so you they tend to get gram variable, and you may miss out on this organism as gram positive, and you may miss out on the reporting. So staining proper steps really make a lot of difference. If you see the next slide again, some gram these are uh, these are joint uh, bacilli. This slide is of, of Cornibacterium diphtheri. Of course, special stains are also there for uh, diphtheria, but gram stain can still diagnose your uh, diphtheria in the uh, preliminary stages of staining uh, or uh, till you get the uh, specific stain. So these are gram positive bacilli bamboo shaped uh, appearance with uh, spores. Uh, suggest you a bacillus anthracis. If you see in next slide, uh, there are again safety pin like appearance like Arsenia pestis. Of course, you don't need this, this kind of slides very uh, very uncommon in our country or it is very difficult to get in our day to day la uh, laboratories where we are working is very rare. Uh, the next slide is the budding yeast cells with pseudo hyphae. Such kind of slides, if you uh, tend to, uh, if you are a technologist or microbiologist, you tend to see very commonly in your laboratories. So, this, uh, this is, uh, I am more uh, like telling you the clinical aspects of every. This, uh, slide here because every slide is giving you some differential diagnosis of that particular sample. So what are the clinical differential diagnosis of a gram stain? So when you release a report, the most common samples we receive are sputum, urine, uh, CSF, um, serial body fluids like pleural fluid, cytic fluid. Then you get uh, pus from uh, sexually transmitted disease, uh, some uh, lymph node uh, ooze, uh, ooze the discharge you may get. So, uh, pus, uh, you get a lot, uh, lot many times from the boys, carbuncle, pistols, abscess, cellulitis fluids, uh, wound infections, stool specimens you get. But all the specimen, uh, if you are a trained uh, 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 trained expert uh, or trained microbiologist uh, or a lab person, you will of course know respiratory tract infections. If you see gram positive cocci with some clearing or capsular, uh, suggestive of some capsular, it is streptococcus pneumon. Uh, a typical thin bacilli appearance, uh, uh, like end to end uh, V or uh, cornered appearance, you get in corny bacterium diphtheri. Now, if it is a CSF sample and you are seeing a lot of pustules with intracellular gram negative foci, it can be Neisseria meningitis. Ocular infections, of course, we get a lot of conjunctivals or corneal ulcer swabs in that you can make out the gram-positive coca and it's really helpful for the ophthalmologist. Once you, uh, if you immediately call them and tell them, it really helps to choose the antibodies. You may save, a, uh, you may save an eye. Uh, with your gram stain report at many times. Urinary tract infection, we, we, lot of, uh, we see a lot of gram negative bacilli. Of course, we have the significant uh, bacteria uh, and uh, colony count and all those things when the culture uh, comes. But any single bacilli if you see in any oil commercial field of the urinary tract infection, it is suggestive of a significant bacteria. bacteria. Gram positive cocci also uh, like gram positive cocci in, uh, in again pairs. So again, gram, gram positive cocci. Okay, Entrococci, 
they are also slightly gram variable they have uh, they are arranged in pairs and uh, of course they are very common common organism calling causing the urinary tract infection then you have candida a lot of female patients pregnant patients have this candidemia and or patients who are on antibiotics or patients who are on immunosuppressed patient they uh, they tend to show candida uh, in patients in the urine sexually transmitted is the most common we get is exuded from the inguinal lymph nodes or the genital area and these are uh, and you can uh, these are very easy to make out if uh, at all you are really expert and you have seen the slides before skin infections of course staphylococcus aureus and streptococcus pyogenes are most commonly reported uh, hospital acquired infections or the wound infections uh, post surgical and all you can get staphylococcus pseudomonas cyanobacteres in gas gangrene or gangrenous uh, foot you may get clostridium perfringens tetanus you can clostridium tetani terminal spores you can make out so uh, very, very classical. So let's give a lot of importance of gram stains. Simple microscopy, the most cheapest method of reporting um, any infection. Uh, and uh, you can uh, give a provisional uh, diagnosis and report to the clinician and help him to treat the patient. Stool specimen, very commonly we get stool specimen for hanging drops. Of course, if you same stain the same, you have some doubt if you stain the specimen, you get commasia bacilli and those are the vibrio. So we can confidently report them as well. So this way, these are the common clinical degrees on gram stain, which we can report depending upon the sample and the clinical correlation. So gram staining shortcomings. So bacteria with damaged cell walls, uh, gram variable results can occur. So uh, as Madam was telling about what is gram variability. So gram variable is something which like, I think I had a slide, but I'm, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, so gram variable, what is gram variable? Gram positive, you see purple organisms. Gram negative, you see pink organisms. So gram positive, we have coca and bacilli. Gram negative, we have coca and bacilli and coco bacilli as well. So there are some organisms like, uh, of course, there is one, because of the shortcomings of the procedure, also we get gram variable. We cannot make out whether it is a gram positive or gram negative. It may be a false gram positive or false gram negative. Right. So, but there are some organisms which are actually gram variable. Like, so these are the, uh, Asanetobacter, Pseudomonas, most of the non-fermenting gram-negative bacilli, they tend to be gram-variable. In gram-positives, what as a, um, I, I, in day-to-day -day practice, which I see, uh, entrococci can be gram-variable. Okay, delicate organisms, like sometimes uh, the delicate or the fastidious organisms, like uh, meningococci, okay, they can be gram-variable. So these are true gram-variable organisms. In that, you need to have an expert eye to find out these organisms they, because these can be gram variable and you can confuse with the common pathogens. As, as I told you, acinetobacter, they are gram negative cocoa bacilli, but they can be, if they are not stained properly or they have more of gram variability, you can confuse it with a staphylococcus. Uh, the microbiologists here, they will agree with me that it happens many times, but if you are expert and if you have seen a lot of slides, uh, these errors uh, of reporting, you can simply get over. So you should have that acumen uh, and clinical correlation. So uh, I hope uh, you have understood. If you have doubt, we can discuss it again. Uh, then uh, so sometimes now, the uh, so we have gram variability because of the improper staining or sometimes faulty organisms. If the cell walls are damaged, too much of subculture done uh, or the sample is heated or the, uh, the it is not, uh, the, uh, the sample is not preserved properly. To, uh, freezing and thawing of the samples. So this can damage the cell walls. So that's why there also, there also can be ground variable results. So less sensitivity of the microscopy in sample smears. So what are the short, one of the shortcomings is, of course, any microscopy, we tend to have a sensitivity of 50 to 60%. I think 60% we take it as a standard for any microscopy reporting. So uh, less sensitivity is one of the shortcomings of any microscopy and also same is true with the gram stain. So, uh, uh, pink stain background. So, the carbon portion is the background stain, not a counter stain. The pink stain background and cellular elements, they look all pink. So, sometimes if you don't have a, uh, expertise, you may miss out on the gram-negative organisms. Use uh, appropriate reagent. So, so if you are using old stains or unfiltered stains or uh, the stains are, uh, are not having a proper concentration or dilution, then you tend to have uh, 
Coming back, coming back to gram staining and shortcomings, as you as I uh, as we said, ki, uh, another shortcoming is uh, the counter stain is pink and cellular elements or the epithelial cells persist tend to be pink, light pink or dark pink. And if there are some delicate organisms uh, uh, which are gram negative, you may miss them. So you need to have that expert acumen when you are reporting a gram stain. As I told you, uh, see a lot of normal slides uh, as, a, as a practice. Uh, daily, you should see gram stains. If you, even if it is urine and sputum samples, many times technology just they skip them. They just avoid a detailed screening of the slide. Uh, more and more slides you see, more and practice makes man perfect. Then only you can identify the uh, abnormal structures. Use proper reagent, erroneous results we can avoid because of this, because old reagent, unfiltered reagents, uh, you may have deposits, okay. Uh, too much heating can uh, have a lot of precipitate in the sample and again you can get bad results. Uh, it's subjective, as you said, a technologist uh, doing the staining procedure uh, if you see one technician is very good at staining and you say Ki, Ari, you only should do all the staining. No, you train all the technician, you do a competency assessment for the staining procedure. Of course, you can improve your results. Overheating, as I told you, and over discoloration and uh, fixation, improper fixation, all this can affect your results. Sensitivity has already discussed less than 60%. It's a cumbersome and time consuming process at times when you have lot many samples. Uh, so that time the quality of the staining can be affected. Of course, automation is, uh, is uh, there, but in India, I don't think so. We are doing any automation for gram staining. If someone is doing great, I, I would like to know your experiences. But per, uh, as per my experience, we are still doing manually and we are happy if you do a proper batches uh, and uh, train your technicians uh, well uh, for it. Quality of the stain, microbiologist experience, like uh, uh, only a microbiologist can be able to tell you okay, whether it's a proper stain or not a proper stain because the expert is matter so your uh, your lab head is an important person uh, for assessing the quality of the smears daily otherwise there is no point in doing improper stains and wasting your reagents and time of everyone so concentrate on the quality of the staining procedure as well as reporting manually prepared slides are less, less reproducible of course in microbiology we always say that uh, reproducibility of the results is a gold standard for any reporting of a pathogen okay but uh manual thing yeah if you have a uh, uh, all SOPs plays, good technologies and everything, the, you tend to get 99% good reproducitive of the results. But if you're a new technician, your results may get affected. Untrained technicians, your results may get affected. So uh, uh, so in gram staining, this short, I think it is in any microscopy, such shortcomings come when it comes to reproducibility of the results. So uh, any doubt in gram stain? I have tried to cover most of the points in gram stain right from the principle uh, to uh, the requirements, uh, then precautions of handling the stain and the smear, care during the smear, quality control, interpretation and reporting, practical aspects, differential diagnosis, morphology of the common morphology you come across when you are reporting, and clinical DDs, uh, shortcomings, so anything in gram staining, I think uh, gram stain, uh, because this is not a big topic, gram staining. So these are the common things which I have touched upon. Uh, any doubt, you can ask me at the end of the session. So coming to the next uh, part of the microscopy uh, is the zeal nelson staining, acid fast staining technique. As compared to, of course, this is also one kind of, uh, this is a really important stain. Of course, it is uh, going to help us diagnose tuberculosis, which is a very important disease for India, being the capital of tuberculosis. And uh, it is very rampantly, very uh, uh, abundantly done across India, where technologies report, social work, I think there are healthcare, healthcare workers in government uh, government practice uh, at a different uh, TB, TB centers, which are reporting the hidden staining technique. Uh, of course, in all our hospitals and lab we are reporting ZN staining or acid fast staining technique. So what is acid fast te uh, stain technique? So, so differential staining which differentiate acid fast organisms from the non-acid fast organisms. Modification of orlation 1882 original method is France, Zeal, Carbol Acid Phenol, uh, he used modern and Frederick Nielsen basic fusion as the primary stain. So this is the technique which we are, which we are still using, the carbol fusion, uh, carbol acid fusion, or the carbol fusion, which is used as the primary stain. 
So requirement of the AFD stain, again, same, similar to our gram stain, the stain is the uh, grease-free clean new slides. Many laboratories, they are reusing the slide. I would say kindly avoid reusing of the slide for AFD stain for sure. Because we uh, because sometimes the slides don't get washed properly. There's a lot of grease on it, soap on it, which will affect the results on quality of your smear. So clean and new slide is always good. I always tell my technicians to wipe the slides with a uh, proper cloth or a clean tissue paper. And then only she starts the staining process. So clean processing desk, grease-free slide. Uh, you should have a good quality specimen, appropriate specimen, glass marking pencil on a label, loops for making the smear, staining rack or the stand, burners and acid fast bacillus stain kit. So uh, um, there are two different methods which are commonly done uh, across. Uh, one is the heat method, which is a conventional method, and one is the cold method. Uh, of course, I come from an old school thought. I prefer the conventional heat method, and so I'll be telling more about it today. So, of course, when you are handling any specimen, again, I emphasize on this point that standard precautions have to be maintained. They just cannot, like standard precautions are the most important thing and uh, we should not compromise on that. And because uh, your safety is really important and uh, uh, safety is uh, you and your premises uh, should be clean uh, and the environment should be clean uh, pre and post the staining or any sample processing. So clean processing desk, grease-free slide, specimen, glass marking, pencil, loop, staining, uh, rag, stand, burners, and AB stain care. Uh, get yourself ready for the process. What is the procedure? Uh, so the procedure is, again, uh, uh, choose your desk properly. Uh, you should be in a well-ventilated area, especially when you are handling this tuberculosis sample. I would say always you should be in a well-ventilated and uh, clean area. Uh, see the appropriateness of the sample, check the pre-analytical requirements like the uh, universal identification, lab ID, uh, the name of the person, the sample type, which area it is come from, uh, confirm all the details of the sample, and then you can choose the appropriate part of the sample. Especially when you are doing the sputum samples, we say all pulmonary samples, get the nucoid or the purulent part of the sample, where you, you, you tend to get a good result. If you take the salivary part of it, if your uh, sample is mixed with full of saliva, I would suggest as a repeat sample because sputum sample is something which can be asked as a repeat. Okay, so if it is a ball sample, a gonky alveolar lavage or a mini ball samples which we, we get, we cannot ask the sample as a repeat. So we may have to go ahead with the process. For sputum samples, you can of course ask for a repeat or induced sputum sample you can ask for. You may just get gastric lavages also for uh, from children because sputum sample is not uh, able to induce from the children. So uh, these are different types of sample we get for pulmonary tuberculosis. So first you see the sample appropriateness, pick the app appropriate part of the sample and then you can go ahead with your sample processing. So in that most um, some people use a broom or swab or, lo or loop. In our laboratory we are using loop, uh, heat the loop properly, take the appropriate uh, quantity of the sample on the loop at least 2 by 3 centimeter like horizontal 3 centimeter and 2 centimeter vertical or adequate. I usually tell my technician that you, you should take a sample of at least 1 rupee coin should be the uh, dimension which should be appropriate. So it is just uh, roughly you can tell the technicians because we, we don't measure with the hand how, how much to take. So adequate smear. Okay, so uh, then you can smear it properly, not too thick, not too thin. And then you uh, air dry it properly. After air dry, we usually tend to avoid heat fixing in uh, uh, AFB stains, but you can just pass and just for the sake of uh, it does, uh, the sample integrity is the smear integrity is maintained and after that what you do is the carbol fusion staining carbol fusion flood the slide with the carbol fusion after flooding it uh, then you heat it from the bottom of it uh, as soon as at the point where the boiling start you have to stop it the fumes start coming you should stop it so it usually take five to eight minutes for that and uh, after you stop it 
then you wash the slide properly after you wash it you declarize with 20 percent h2so4 which is common which is commonly used uh, in practical all laboratories across and uh, once uh, once you declarize it you put a methylene blue stain uh, for 30 seconds rinse it again then blot it again i usually avoid blotting i would uh, prefer to air dry it and then you can see the slide under the oil immersion i hope it's clear so make a label, air dry, fix it, label the slide, cover the slide with corbel pushing, heat intermittently without boiling for 5 to 8 minutes, wash with water, cover with 20% H2SO4 for 1 minute. If declaration is complete, then wash it, wash uh, counter st uh, stain with methylene blue for 15 to 20 seconds and you are done. So how do you interpret the ZN staining? In ZN staining, we are going to see the acid fast structures acid fast bacilli. So uh, since it is commonly known for tuberculosis, so of course we are going to see the acid fast bacilli against the blue background. So blue background is because of the methylene blue. And uh, you can see the structures like pus cells or other cells or debris which are blue looking. Okay. And on that nice blue background, you will see bright pink or bright red bacilli. Okay. And you should have a good microscope because sometimes uh, depending upon what lamp you are using, halogen lamp or a LED lamp, slightly there may be change in the intensity of the pink color. If you, you use a halogen lamp microscope, it actually looks bright red to pink color. And on halo, uh, on LED lamps, it, they look actually pink, uh, pink in color. So uh, though for tuberculosis bacilli, a bright background of blue and red beaded uh, bacilli. This is the uh, common picture you will see. Quality control again positive is we usually tell uh, known positive samples. If you have a to uh, have a um, uh, known positive sample, known MTB positive sample, you can just prepare prepare a lot of smears, uh, fix it properly uh, by alcohol or acetone and keep it. Uh, you can store them. And whenever you want to do a QC with a new batch, you can use it for QC. This is commonly done. I would don't. I will not say to preserve that positive sample in a lab for long days. Why to get, infect uh, our staff unnecessarily? Instead, you make multiple smears and keep it and you can use it for your QC whenever you want. So positive is from, so you can positive control smear from a known case of MTB patient stain with the ZN stain and negative is usually E. coli. They will tend to look blue color. So um, it's non-acid past. So uh, it is uh, negative is E. coli you can take. So interpretation and reporting, again, we, we do a grading here. So in uh, what is different uh, difference from gram stain and ZN stain is uh, other other stains usually we don't have a uh, like we grade the bacilli as per our clinical observations and findings. For tuberculosis, we have a standard uh, government or standard national bodies who have graded grade, have a grading standards. Like we have CDC standard, we have WHO or RNTCP standards. So you, you can pick any standard or guidelines for reporting and follow it. You have a complete uh, TB uh, laboratory uh, tuberculosis testing uh, uh, manual uh, on your RNTCP or TB websites uh, in India. You can follow those. Uh, correct me if you are wrong somewhere, but uh, we uh, we also tend to uh, follow the same guidelines. We don't differ from that. So in uh, so in the CDC method, what are the uh, what does the guidelines say for grading? In grading, if you see one uh, like zero uh, zero A B, so usually we tend to screen when there is negative sample. We tend to screen three hundred uh, uh, fields. Uh, for reporting any negative report. But we usually in a daily day-to-day -day practice uh, and when you have a, a good amount of workload, 300 screening is not that possible. We tend to cover the whole smear as far as possible. And if you don't see anything, we report it as negative. One to two uh, bacilli per whole smear, doubtful positive, or it is reported as scanty as per CDC. One to nine, 400 fields is one plus. One to nine per 10 fields is two plus. One to nine per single field is three plus. And more than nine per single field is four plus. So this is the CDC method. We tend to follow this WHO or IUA TLD uh, method. In this, uh, when no AB are seen for 100 fields, it is negative. Uh, negative for any acid pass bacilli. One to nine AB in 100 fields, uh, it is recorded one to nine. And, and we mention how many bacilli uh, we have seen like if it is a scanty grading we report five bacilli we have seen and it is a scanty grade and so many fields were inspected so in 10 if you see 10 to 99 we report it as one plus in 100 fields one to 10 bacilli 
in 50 fields, 2 plus, and more than 10 AFB in each slide, 20 fields, 3 plus. These guidelines are freely available on the websites. You can just Google them and you can get them. I would always say when you are reporting in a report, so you should always mention, for example, if this is XYZ patient uh, from this particular hospital, of course, you mention it in the uh, report patient details, gross of the sample, whether it is a mucoid sample, mucopurulent sample, mucopurulent mixed with her saliva or a salivary sample, you should mention that in your report. After that, you should mention what you have seen, your results, like whether it is a, uh, a negative, like no acid fast bacilli, one plus, two plus, three plus, whatever you have seen, and always mention the reference for your grading. I see many reports which don't mention anything. It is just negative or positive, one plus, four plus, two plus, whatever grading is written, but what grading guideline you are following, you need to report that. It's always good to do that. And of course, you should always instruct in your report like uh, uh, about the appropriateness of the sample, uh, whether the sample was uh, like, you should always have a comment. If the, really the sample was not appropriate, you should mention it on it. In commercial laboratories, it is really difficult to get a fresh sample again from the patient. So it's always give you a safe, uh, safe environment to report when you are putting some uh, comment uh, in your box or any, if you have a, a hemorrhagic sample, hemorrhagic samples in tuberculosis, uh, try to understand they interfere with the staining. RBCs interfere with yeah. the staining. So we used to initially do distilled water. We used to put to so that I, RBCs get lies and you can do the staining properly. But it doesn't happen always. And, and it's difficult. Instead of the, And this red sample, if it's a hemorrhagic sample, uh, so you should always put a note that it's a hemorrhagic sample. So it clinician also understand because of the hemorrhagic sample, the stains results can be uh, affected. I uh, Most of the microbiologists will agree with me for this. Uh, so if it's a tissue AB stain, most of the tertiary labs have uh, histopathology department uh, where they are reporting tuberculosis in their uh, histopathology. Uh, at the same time, they do report AFB staining uh, when they are suspecting tuberculosis. So, uh, uh, it is a simple, not very different method. It's just that xylene has, uh, has to be put to remove the paraffin on the tissue uh, stains and then you can repeat the same procedure as we did for the ZN stain. So what is Jaden stain? Uh, what does acid pass mean? So th these mycobacterium structures or these uh, kind of organisms should have mycolic acid impermeable, uh, which is impermeable to any stain. So aniline dyes uh, like heat or uh, even they're heated, they're the phenols. So uh, heat softens the wax stain and it penetrates the staining. Pushin dye soluble phenol liquids, uh, they, uh, they, they are soluble and so they enter the cell wall. Once then they resist decolorization, phenol acts as modern, mycobacterium retain the stain pink and background is colorized as blue. So because of the mycolic acid, uh, this special stain has to be, uh, has to be done because gram stain will not work here. Precautions during staining of, of hidden staining reagents. So these are the all the any stain reagents that are corrosive. Uh, so they have to be handled well. Uh, use again the standard precaution for handling the stains as well as handle the specimens. Use again a biosafety cabinet. Use spectacles, goggles, disposable gloves, face mask, and waterproof apron when you are handling any kind of specimen. And of course, the stains are corrosive, so you should always use uh, barrier precautions like gloves so that you you also don't affect your skin uh, or the aerosols might affect your eyes or you may inhale, inhale the toxic fumes. So always be prepared. Rinsing step uh, should be gently. Uh, again, I told uh, told you many times the taps are very uh, with lot of force of water. You are all you you make almost fifty smears and all get just washed off. And you are busy with something else. By the time you return, all the stain is washed off. So you should be careful. Rinsing step should so that's why the, it should be a gentle rinsing step. Heat carefully. Don't do overheating. Drying of the stain can occur. Deposition of the stain pattern. More you heat, you may end up precipitating the dye on the smear, and your stain is gone. Uh, your microscopy is gone. The position of the stain particles happen and morphology can get distorted. Fle fresh blotting paper is smear. So, uh, so you cannot use the old blotting papers uh, and uh, uh, so just blot it. Every time new you use or just air dry it, simple. It's new slides, every specimen, they should be grease free. So what are the modifications of AIB which are, uh, because there are not, uh, not only MTB, there are many acid pass structures. Acid pass organisms like Mycobacterium tuberculosis, Mycobacterium leprae, Cryptosporidium species, Actinomyces, Nocaria, spores. 
Okay, so in this mycobacterium, the uh, alcohol tuberculosis, we are using 20% H2SO4. In leprae, we use 5% H2SO4. In cryptosporidium, 1%. Actinomyces, 0.5%. No cardia, 1%. Spores, 0.25% H2SO4. Alcohols, uh, these are the secondary decolorizer. Acid alcohols uh, are usually, uh, are also used, especially with leprae. Uh, you, you tend to use other decolorizers. Uh, HCL also, we, we can use, um, but standard 20% uh, H2SO4 for tuberculosis and other concentration for H2SO4 I've already given you. Cold method, as I told you, many uh, the ready-made cold method kits available where you can completely skip the heat, uh, heat uh, thing and your increases the concentration of the basic cushion and phenol and heat is avoided as an advantage. But uh, my experience uh, is very good with the conventional heat method. The results are really good. Of course, there are fluorescent stain for acid fast bacteria available. Uh, in fluorescent stain, the fluorescent dyes are used. They are used in this stain complex to the micro. The, the fluorescent dyes used in this are, are they form the stain complex to the mycolic acid in the acid fast cell walls. Detection of the fluorescent cell is enhanced by the brightness against a dark background. Um, of course, it is a costly method. You require a specific, a, speci uh, a specialized uh, dark microscope, a fluorescent microscope uh, lens you require for that, dark room you require for it, and of course, expertise. Because a lot of artifacts also get stained by fluorescent. Uh, so you require expertise for this. Uh, so it's not a routine uh, acid fast staining, which is possible in every now every lab. Uh, specialized lab usually have the facility. They can go ahead with it. Procedure primary stain, oramine phenol, all stain is used 10 minutes. Decolorize one uh, decolorize a one person acid alcohol for five minutes. Counter stain with 0.1 potassium permanganate. So, what are the shortcomings of the ZN stain? Of course, you uh, shortcomings is use of scratch slide or old slide can cause problem. As I told, greasy slides can cause a problem. Uh, wash slide with soap and water can interfere your results. Prolonged staining can interfere your results. Over declaration, because remember one thing, in gram stain, you, your diagnosis will not change completely. In AFB stain, if the patient is positive, a complete diagnosis and the uh, the treatment will completely change for the consultant. So, be, so I usually prefer, I myself see the slides in my lab of all the ZN stains because uh, it requires a lot of expertise because it's not only uh, the pulmonary samples because pulmonary you can get it again but if you use a, a precious sample, the tissue the FNSs, the, the uh, those samples, the CSF, the can that those cannot be repeated for ZN staining, right? So you just trust your best technician or your uh, you yourself see the ZN slides. Uh, it really makes difference in the reporting and the clinical management of the patient. So uh, over declaration is a problem, under declaration is a problem. Improperly clean cell can give you false positive or false absolutely false results. Cumbersome, it's uh, yeah, it is a cumbersome staining method uh, and it is subjective. Of course, it is subjective when it comes to grading. So grading also, it has to be done in a proper way. You we tell a zigzag method, a Z-like Z method, or from left to right, you start the screening so that you complete the smear properly and screen the complete smear so that you don't miss out or you give a wrong grading. If you are into private uh, laboratories practicing, you have this local corporation bodies who send their healthcare professionals to assess your slides. The RNTC people come to assess uh, your grades, grading. Right, we have to report the tuberculosis slides. So uh, it's important you report it, it properly. So which are the common acid per structures? They are the mycobacterium tu tuberculosis, uh, MOTTs, mycobacterium, other than tuberculosis. Also, we call them as non-tuberculous mycobacterium. No cardia species, cryptosporidium species, cyclospora species, isospora species, and fungal spores. So in tuberculosis, you must have, most of you must have already seen, if you see the top slide, it is of tuberculosis, like uh, mostly a blue background with uh, thin beaded uh, bacilli you see, which is very standard, you will never forget the slide once you see it. So uh, of, uh, it's a really beautiful slide uh, uh, and you will never forget it. So mycobacterium tuberculosis, if it is an NTM, non-tuberculous bacteria, you see pleomorphic, thin, broken, uh, pleomorphic structures like different shape structures uh, uh, which is nothing to match with the tuberculosis bacilli then you can think of NTM of course NTM can be confused with some artifacts also uh, but uh, once you as I told you more normal slides you see you can see more negative slides usually you can uh, you can confidently report the pathogenic slides
So Macrobacterium leprae, yes, lepra bacilli, you see uh, cigar bundles, stacked appearance. These are typical. They appear in clusters or stacked upon structures. They are uh, slight, uh, and you can make out. They don't look like tuberculosis bacilli. They don't look like any M uh, NDM bacilli. And these are typical structures. And they just stain with 5% H2SO4. And these are clinical correlated samples. So you cannot miss on lepra bacilli also. No cardia, you, you see, uh, of course, uh, this is not a great photograph, but uh, you can absolute these are thin long branching filaments acid pus structures and they're light pink in color you can absolutely make out because they're very thin and so you cannot complete it you need an expertise again your so you and of course clinical correlation then only you can report these samples cryptosporidium parvum cyclospor these are opportunistic stool pathogens these are parasites so you're also when you get sample stool sample for opportunistic parasites or for more uh, or modified zn for opportunistic parasites uh, then you can you find such kind of structures again here you require a lot of expertise uh, so these are uh, images from the internet of course we have reported in my i have also reported my colleagues have reported these structures in their laboratories uh, then isospora, these are elliptical, again, they are uh, uh, elliptical, nice, oval uh, parasites found in uh, opportunistic, uh, patient, opportunistic immunocompromised patients uh, in the stool. Uh, then this mycobacterium fortunum, again, it's NTM, if you see here, they are branching or pleomorphic bacilli. So clinical diagnosis, how is miles and still useful to a clinician? Because we can report mycobacterium tuberculosis from various specimens, maybe pulmonary or the extrapulmonary specimens. Opportunistic inpatient in the stool in the form of parasites like isospora, cyclospora, or cryptosporidium is very commonly reported and it can be easily reported. Leprosy, yes, the clinical, uh, the, this multi posse bacillary or multi bacillary, uh, we call the leprosy patches. If you take up appropriate uh, sample, uh, you can surely report leprosy uh, very well. No cardiosis, uh, expert is required here for leprosy, also expert is required, but if trained properly, they are not very difficult to report. So summary, so summary of any microscopy as such, but today I am talking about Gram and ZN. So the summary is the expertise and experience, which is most important to interpret and report. Use standard SOP for your QA, QC and references for your techniques and reporting. Quality control should be a part of your daily reporting with every batch of stains which are prepared. You should have a quality assurance program for all your processes in the laboratory, which will, which will assure you a good report. Use standard precautions while handling any clinical specimen. Uniform and appropriate staining gives you best of the results. So thank you so much. This is all about gram staining and ZN staining. Of course, uh, I have touched upon most of the practical aspects uh, which we are doing in a day-to-day -day laboratory reporting. Thank you so much, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi. In fact, um, me as a biochemist could understand a lot of things today. And uh, it makes a lot of difference to us as well and to the, all the technicians, the doctors, uh, the entire fraternity for microbiology who have joined in today. Thank you so much, ma'am. Ma'am, there are some questions for you. Yeah, yeah. You take the question and answers, ma'am. Ma'am, Raksha is asking what comments can be put for an, an aerobic infection if it can be identified in a gram stain? It is very difficult to identify anaerobic infection as a part of like gram stain because anaerobic infection, the sample appropriateness is very important. Uh, it requires a transport medium. You cannot just have an open sample uh, for anaerobic and they are telling you to do a gram stain. So uh, this is one. Uh, you may lose the integrity of the smear and you can just put if it is an anaerobic sample come and if you see something, you can put in a comment that uh, you have seen a, this gram positive bacilli or gram negative bacilli which we have seen, which will help the clinician to at least start the antibiotic and, uh, and also inform about the appropriateness of the smear or sample. Thank you, ma'am. So I hope, Raksha, that this answers your question. Uh, the next question by Raksha is, can you explain how to do a corrective and preventive action for a gram stain enrolled in an ECAS program? If we have a missed mark or score less for a particular parameter, Within the stain, like instead of expected many inflammatory cells, we have reported few inflammatory cells. While re-screening, we still find a few cells. How do we ensure mm -hmm. the subjectivity is taken into consideration in an ECAS program? Uh, now there are two aspects to it. One is uh, what report you are sending because whatever is he, you have to report. 
right number one and what corrective and preventive action the rca because your scoring is reduced when you get the result so what we do usually is we usually uh, train our staff for that subjectivity is was a very important thing so we should train our staff for uh, staining as well as interpretation of the results and second thing uh, uh, usually uh, this um, most of the staff uh, uh, like we we lose lot of marks in grading or we lose a lot of mark in uh, they require provisional uh, diagnosis, like suggest you or something. So those aspects has to be trained. Training is one part and repeat as a, uh, this competency assessment for your uh, staining procedure. So that two things only will solve your problem. Because again, I tell you, it is a subjective thing. And if you lose mark, we cannot, uh, like it is an irreversible thing done. We can improve for the next uh, equals program. Ma'am, she mentions that uh, when they have done a re-screening, still if they find that it is, or they find few cells, then in such a case, how do they report it, ma'am? No, uh, my experience, I would tell you, I report whatever I see. Uh, now, uh, if there cannot be a gross thing. There are plenty of cells in the original report and you have reported occasionally. It not a difference. So it is important uh, that you screen it or repeat it because the smears are already done and sent. So uh, there is not, not much we can do. If anyone wants to add something, can add. But I think we cannot do much thing. Just improve your competency in staining and we can improve in our next sequence program. So probably and that is the, the that is what is accepted by the auditors for your lab as well. If you are an NMA assessor, you they will see what action you have taken for that, uh, that uh, mass which are scored less. Okay. okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next question is by Dr. Sharda Devi Manur. Uh, she's asking the gastroenterologist ask for a stool sample for gram stain. What should we look for as a pathogen? Uh, I don't think so. A stool is an appropriate test. Stool for gram stain is not a, it's absolutely inappropriate and waste of resources. It's my personal opinion or a expert opinion as well. Uh, please ask your gastro gastroenterologist to be very specific for gram stain. I only, uh, I don't think so. I can accept gram negative bacilli. We can find out anything else. Oh, of course, pustules, we can of course tell them, but I don't think so. It is appropriate test as well. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Talk Dr. to your gastroenterologist. <laughs> yes. So, uh, Dr. Alka Kapoor has given a, a, a wide uh, question. She says quality control for gram stain. So, so it's, I've you... already taken the whole session, and uh, if you wait, you see, I have already told you. And uh, QC positive and negative control with every batch of staff and E. coli, you do it. I think that should be sufficient for your uh, NABL or any quality assessment program. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, an anonymous, anonymous attendee is asking, can't we store positive samples for QC purpose after treating the sample? I didn't understand. Uh, I think so. What, what uh, this attendee means to say is that if there is a positive sample, for the ZN or AFB, he's not, he or she is not mentioned. If it is for ZN sample, I would not say to preserve any positive TB samples. As I told you, you can make multiple smears and keep and, and uh, dis, uh, dis, like uh, uh, heat fix it or alcohol fix it so that we can preserve them for a longer time and use it for a QC purpose in your future uh, testing, uh, stain um, batch verifications. Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much. Nikita Panchal has a question. How to don QC for Nicardia or Mycobacterium leprae or Cryptosporidium species? Basically, negative control you can do. For positive control, known strains, if you have, you can use. That is uh, that is true for all the acid fast stains. Basically, we are going to assess the acid fastness of the organism. So, the practical answer would be that only. If you and uh, of course positive samples, if you have, I would if I have a mycobacterium lepre positive sample, I would prefer to stain it with uh, it, but it's not very commonly available. No, sorry. Uh, Nisha has a question How do we report pustules in fluids, OIF or LPF? Thank you. Uh, I usually report uh, if it is come for routine examination, I usually report LPF or HPF. Uh, but so, if you are uh, uh, which is, uh, for which a gram is, staining, for gram staining, you can uh, report in OIF. We are reporting in OIF. Most of the microbiologists report in oil immersion field. Like, and we don't uh, number it. Quantification, like, uh, we don't do. We report it as plenty, abundant, moderate, occasional. So this is the ideal method, ma'am. 
Yeah, as gram strain, we are reporting just relative reporting. Quantification is possible if you have some quantification or dilution you have made or you have chambers uh, for quantification. Thank you so much. Uh, Palosha has uh, uh, query says that as positive and negative controls to be run with each batch as per your presentation and as well as uh, NABL 112, is it each batch of the day or batch lot as a whole for that particular reagent? Uh, I think uh, most of the enable assessors we agree is uh, each uh, each for every at the beginning of every day we usually uh, do gram staining uh, QAQC or Z staining QAQC and if a uh, if in that particular day in, in bigger hospitals the lot also changes very frequently because of the huge workload so at lot verification also we have to do a QAQC at both places that is the ideal answer. Okay, and ma'am, in case if the sample uh is very less not in terms of the quantity but in terms of the number of samples then in that case also like even for one or two samples you have to do the positive as well as the negative controls every day even if because gram stain is gram and is not a very costly affair it is it is always i would recommend it to do it at the beginning of every day that is a standard answer even if your sample load is less uh Nafish Saifi has a question. I have received many body fluids for gram staining organism, not seen, but many WBC seen. It's report. Is it should you report it? Yeah, for pustules, so we report in the in gram stain. And if you're not seeing an organisms, actually cytocentrifuge is commonly done at many hospitals. Uh, and after cytocentrifuge, you do the staining. Uh, it 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 improves your results. Okay. So that you can follow so that you may see the organisms also and you can report the puzzles also well. So yes, you can report uh, like a uh, few, uh, few puzzles seen and no organisms seen. Yes, you can report. Whatever you see, you can report. Fine. So if, if only uh, there are no uh, organisms seen, yeah, yeah, yeah. but only WBC, yes. you can report that. Yes, you can report because uh, inflammatory cells can be there, no? Yes, Okay, fine. Uh, Deepali Singh has a question that, ma'am, can you uh, tell me about the quality control gram and AV stain and what duration this uh, main should be maintained and the documentation regarding it? Uh, you mean to uh, say the daily checklist, whether you have done or not done? It is the yes. same as uh, as you maintain for other things, no? the media or other, other uh, things you maintain. Like... I think annually we go every two years we go for an NAB, NABL uh, assessment or any assessment program. So usually the assessors ask the data of last two years. If you are a regular enroller, if you are you are applying for the first time, they usually see a data of last six months or or one year at least. Okay. So uh, uh, if uh, the last six months, as you say. So at least for the newbies, they have to maintain the record for the last six months. Sorry, last six months. Whatever is sent in the NABL one one two document. Okay. I have not seen the latest uh, latest edition yet. I have not attended the latest edition program. But whatever is mentioned in the NABL one one two document, you uh, keep. Or when you start uploading the documents, you you uh, the timeline is mentioned there for uploading the documents. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, there's one question from Dr. Alka. In case of fluids, instead of 20% H2SO4, is it better to use acid alcohol? And is it available commercially? Acid alcohol is not... Um, like I, I am practicing in Mumbai area, so we are using H2SO4. I think it is uh, available very well and you can maintain your quality very well. So what is available on a large scale, you can use. Yes, you can use acid alcohols as well. That's good, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Zubair, uh, should we report candida on sputum and gram stain considering they may be commensals? Gram stain, yes, you can report, but you can always add a comment that uh, suggests you have commensal flora. Okay. Uh, I think so, ma'am. This completes all the questions that have been on the Q&A and, uh, of course, in the chat box as well. Okay, we have a question from Nisha. Uh, she's asking, do we have to quantify pus cells in respiratory samples other than sputum? Uh, yeah, we do. We, we just mention whatever we have seen. 
uh, so, you don't need to quantify in a quantitative form. Like uh, for sputum samples, we have this Murray Washington's grading where we report the appropriateness of that. On the low power field, uh, we grade. Like for example, if, this, uh, if there are more than 25 persons per low power field and less than 10 epithelials per low power field, that is grade three, then only we consider the, take the sample forward for culture processing. Okay. So that we don't waste our resources. It is usually followed in big uh, uh, government hospital labs or uh, tertiary care labs because uh, we, we, we don't get good results in that. So this grading is followed for sputum samples, but we don't follow such kind of grading for any other a sample respiratory sample other than sputum because they are we uh, bowel sample or tracheal secretions no we we usually don't uh, grade them as we do it for sputum so you can mention whatever you have seen but if you see uh, uh, grossly feel it is completely inappropriate like a tracheal secretion you may have the localized uh, uh, flora there coming in so you can also always mention that and uh, talk to your consultant about it if you can get a uh, repeat suction uh, respiratory uh, suction secretions which are commonly sent so they can send a suction again fine ma'am I hope Nisha, this answers your the question that you have asked. Uh, we have a question from Parvati who says, "Can we use the crystal violet and Gram's iodine in the same time?" No, we cannot use this. Is proper step to follow. Now, first step is crystal violet, one minute waiting. The next step is a Gram's iodine, then one minute waiting. Same time, nahi So uh, it 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 can be done, but it has to be done step by step. It has to be done, ma'am. That is a step we have to follow. No. Yes. mix That is for sure. If you are absolutely new to staining, uh, please, basic principles of staining is uh, technical guidelines, standard technical guidelines in your textbooks you follow. Uh, you have this um, Anand Narayan textbook for microbiology. You have Kornman's textbook for microbiology, Bailey Scott for microbiology. Uh, these are the commonly used. And uh, sorry, Alana, because I have passed many years back. <laughs> Uh, so these were the textbooks which we commonly used. Okay. And um, there's one more question. Mackie. That, Mackie uh, is there. Mackie also you can follow for microbiology. Those are four which were commonly followed for microbiology. Okay. So these are the, I would say, the gold standard books. Yeah, yeah. Jo padke padke hum log... Jee, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, can, can I report WBC and epithelials both? Actually, this is an incomplete question. But I think so, the anonymous attendee wants to know whether WBC and epithelial both can be reported in any of the results, in the reports. Dr. Vijay Lakshmi? I think my internet was unstable. Yes, yes, ma'am. So, uh, there's this question from an anonymous attendee who presumably is asking whether WBC and epithelial cells both can be reported. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. You are audible. Uh, so I was just telling you that I think uh, I was not audible properly. So commercial kids, no, they also give their uh, timings and the steps. Steps usually don't change, but the time may change slightly. Okay. okay. So you okay. can standardize those kids and uh, and uh, start using it at your laboratory. Fine, ma'am. Uh... Ma'am, there's another question, uh, which I'll just repeat. Uh, an anonymous attendee is asking whether the WBC and epithelial cells both can be reported. In which sample? It, uh, uh, the question is... Uh, huh. So usually, sputum samples and urine samples, epithelial cells are there. Yes, you can report. Uh, no, uh, no problem in that because it will give a uh, message to the clinician or of course us that there may be uh, the, uh, the collection may be inappropriate as I told you about the Murray Washington's grading for sputum the more the epithelial the sample is inappropriate so you can report of course there are no persons uh, usually in pus samples you don't get epithelial cells not many in a serial body fluid you may not get epithelial cells so don't make a gross thing. In some samples, there are never any epithelial cells. Don't report epithelial cells in those samples. Right, ma'am. Right. So I think so. This calls for uh, answering all the questions that have come in the Q&A. Okay, one more has come in. Uh, Prakash is asking, can we stain gram-positive, gram-negative organisms and pus cells with three, with three different colors? So it's easy to report. 
No, I don't. I didn't understand the question, ma'am. Like, uh, uh, what I understand, Prakash is asking is that one slide can we have some kind of a positive, negative, as well as the pastels also uh, stained in three different colors at the same time so that it can be reported together. Sorry, I didn't understand the question yet because this is something if uh, if you can throw light on this question because uh, the gram stain has only two colors. One is gram positive and one gram negative. Yeah, and something that can identify a pus cells as well. In no, we don't, I, I, at least I am not aware of any such kind of modification in gram stain. <laughs> But yes, if you can want to differentiate more and more slides, you see practice miss man perfect. Pustules are usually larger in larger size. Uh, you can uh, see dark nuclei. You can make out the uh, polymorpho uh, nuclear uh, bodies in like uh, nucleus in it, uh, which is dark pink in color. Uh, usually the backgrounds is light pink. Uh, these cells are dark pink. Epithelial cells are light pink with a nucleus which is bright pink. And of course your bacteria are uh, bright pink. And uh, if it is a gram negative and gram positive or purple. So practice very well. You yes. will be thorough with your gram staining. Yes. So in fact, you can start identifying only with the, the, the staining for gram positive and negative. The rest of the cells can also be identified. I remember in my curriculum, in my college days, we were told uh, uh, as residents, we were told to see a lot of sputum slides. Mm -hmm. yeah, because sputum samples have a lot of organism you can see a lot of gram positive organism you may see yeast cells also you may see gram negative also a lot of pus cells also epithelial cells. so you uh, see a lot of sputum slides you will be thorough with your gram state you will be, be able to identify different structures that's great ma'am so ma'am i think so now we are ending with the question answers the moment i say that ma'am there's one <laughs> question pops up so ma'am carbol fusion heat method best or the cold method I've already told you my my personal favorite is or I trust more on the carbol fusion heat method. It the results are good. I don't deny that the cold method is bad, but it is uh, since last fifteen like to since last fifteen years I am reporting on the heat method only. And most of the senior microbiologists will always suggest to use heat method. Okay. Any more questions? So we have answered to the 16 questions which have been on the Q&A and a couple of questions which have been on the chat message. Uh, Ma'am, there is one more uh, chat message. Is Barlett scoring is necessary uh, in report or maybe done in worksheet and report only Gramstein report without score? No, Barlett stating we usually do in our own worksheet. We don't report. Okay. Uh, most of the labs don't report. It is for our, uh, it is for our quality, uh, quality assessment of the sample. So it is for ourselves. Uh, you did not report it on paper. That's great, ma'am. And uh, many labs use gram stain reporting as few, moderate, many, and many as numerical. That is one plus, two plus, three plus, oh, yeah. which is most commonly done. What should we follow? Any guidelines? Please suggest. There is no such guidelines for grading. Standard. Uh, most of the labs across microbiology labs across are reporting as moderate, abundant, several, or a tra uh, like occasional. No, as such quantification. So there are no guidelines for this, ma'am. No, because no. I am uh, not. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. In the last fifteen years, I have not come across such guidelines where I can report in a numerical way. Okay, so the the opinions can vary. Yeah, Between because microbiologist. No opinions because quantification we are not doing. We are not counting on any chamber or there is no dilution method for making some formula and getting a thing done as we do it for the routine fluid samples. You are aware. So there is no, nothing such done for gram negative and we are seeing in oil immersion field. In oil immersion field, whatever we see is the uh, very focused uh, image. So in that we cannot, it is not good, it is not advisable to do any quantification. We can just grade them as per uh, just assessment, like moderate person, moderate plenty. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. So for some other questions regarding the recording of this session, uh, yes, we have a record of this session and this would be available on the Kaho website, www.kaho.in. And uh, this is there in the, uh, the, uh, the details which is there uh, for the CD sessions, it is presented. 
So you can visit the website and you would get uh, subject to you being a part of the Kaho family. So I request you all for those who have not been a part of the Kaho family as yet, please do join us and uh, keep your learning person awake. Uh, there's a lot to discuss and a lot to see and read and a lot of uh, references that are also there. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi. This in fact has been a wonderful presentation, uh, quite enlightening. Uh, we got a lot to know from this. And uh, yes, uh, we are still having questions and we still have some time. So ma'am, gram staining performing time. What should be crystal violets filter? I think he must be asking time. So usually crystal violet is one minute which we take. Okay. No, I am I'm, I'm not very sure about this filter that has been asked. I think he must be sometimes the old stains, uh, no, they uh, uh, sometimes people have a habit is uh, on the slide they put the Wattman filter paper and then do the staining to improve okay. the results. Okay. Or so they filter the, the filter stains. Uh -huh. okay. It is what he is asking. The, uh, I don't know what he is asking. If it is time, it is one minute. That's great. That's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi. And, and we are apologies. Able to learn a lot from you in yeah, our sure, sure. sessions as well. Yeah. Uh, so I'm absolutely you. like apologies uh, uh, for uh, I don't know what happened with my camera. Uh, so you cannot see me. <laughs> so you can re remember me with my voice. <laughs> And no, ma'am, we have seen you in the initial <laughs> phase and we will remember you always, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much. Us. And thanks, Kaho, uh, for giving me this opportunity, especially Dr. Aparna Jairam, madam, who has trusted me for this topic and uh, looking forward for more such educational sessions. This is excellent uh, for the uh, students and the technologists uh, who are into... Uh, who are looking forward for opportunities as microbiology or pathology technicians. Thank you so much, Dr. Santwana Thank you, and Kaho team. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, Vijay Lakshmi, I am, we are going to invite you. You are our family. So you will be uh, in, into this. Our next KahoCon is happening in Calcutta. Uh, I want you, Ata Tuza, I am April. Yes, yes. First April 2021. Uh, first April 2023, I will be uh, like uh, coming, like my president tenure will be over. Yeah, so I am happy because you have done already good job. Now I will, uh, we will, uh, Santwana, me, Ami, Sagay, Tula, Hachat, Khetsun, Dew. So, um, uh, thank you, you so much. Wherever and possible, I will, I will surely ship in. I know that. And thank you, Rabina, for doing a super fantastic uh, uh, job along with the secretariat. I have to thank um, all your team. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think Santwana, always my man, Lady Friday, I will say. Uh, to there and, and uh, Ravi Kumar sir was also there so thank you so much. Participants who are there right now with us we have a next session on the 17th of November generally we have it on every second Friday of the month from 4 to 6 p.m but this time being Diwali we are having it on the 17th of November from 4 to 6 p.m and our next topic is from biochemistry the concept of bias total allowable errors and six sigma and the speaker for uh, this particular topic is Dr. Punita Bhatia a well-known and renowned person in the field of quality. She's a senior consultant in HOD biochemistry and immunoassays at the Healthians Lab, Gurgaon. Uh, to go forward, can it, uh, we have the uh, four consecutive sessions at the same time at four different places for 15189 2022 uh, for the NAB accredited lab. And uh, this training program is at Vijay Hospitals, Chennai, uh, the Ruben Memorial Hospital, Patna, Downtown Hospitals, Guwahati, Assam and the Rajakiri hospitals at Kochi. So uh, this is on the 28th and 29th October, Saturday and Sunday. We request you all to register on the Kaho uh, platform, the Kaho website and do attend the session. It's free and it's really going to help you all with your future assessments. And uh, please block your dates. The D-Day for all of us is on the 4th of April for the pre-conference workshop of the Kaho LabCon. And the conference is on the 5th of April, 2024. And the venue is the Biswa Bang Bangla uh, Convention Center at Kolkata. Uh, this is going to be our third edition. And we have had two successful editions in the past. A lot of learning. And I'm looking forward to see you all in the Kaho Lapcon as well.